Manassas. Antietam. Fredericksburg. Gettysburg. Appomattox Courthouse. For four terrible years, battlefields like these claimed 600,000 lives. Consecrated with blood, these meadows and forests have become a permanent legacy of the heartache and heroism of the American Civil War. A Union hero of Gettysburg, Joshua Chamberlain of Maine, reflecting on the carnage, accurately predicted that legacy. Generations that know us not and that we know not of shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream. The triumphs and tragedies of the American Civil War battlefields did not go unrecorded. Just at the dawning of the photographic age, photographers, chief among them Matthew Brady, photographed the grisly results of the war between the states. Artists of the day were likewise moved to capture the battles and the men who fought them. They were used in the newspapers and magazines of the period. Modern artists, such as Dale Gallion and Don Troiani, still draw inspiration from these battlefields. But the battle scenes depicted in this program are troop engagements between men from a broad range of jobs and professions who are reliving history. They breathe new life into Civil War heroes, such as General Jeb Stuart, the daring Confederate, who wore a plume in his hat and a flowing cape, or fighting Joe Hooker, the Union general, who led his troops into battle fire riding a splendid white horse. During the time spent reliving history, they bunk in 1860-type army tents. Though, unlike real Civil War camps, wives and girlfriends are sometimes present to help prepare the victuals. Some share Dixie. Some, the battle hymn of the Republic but they do not share the weevil-infested hardtack of Billy Yank, or the goober peas of Johnny Reb, or the real hunger of Lee's starving troops, or the real killing of brother against brother. What they do share is spirit, the spirit of the men who fought the war between the states. Well, I, I believe that we should save the Union. The, the, the country divided in half is not going to survive. And I thoroughly believe that our forefathers meant this to be a strong, united country. And uh, I, I believe very thoroughly in that, and I'm willing to fight very hard for it. I'm less to fight this war to put down secession. You know how a soldier likes his tobacco? And if this war lasts very long, Good tobacco may be hard to get because you know all the best is grown down here at the south. But I expect once we get to Richmond, we'll have all the good, fine Virginia Burley that we'll ever need. Uh, my state seceded, and I felt my loyalties were with it. I enlisted because my country is being invaded. So it was only natural that I should join him when our shores were attacked by the vile damn Yankees. 
Others relive history armed with cameras and picnic baskets, shod in comfortable walking shoes. Across the Potomac from Washington, D.C., is the state of Virginia, where the city of Richmond served as the capital of the Confederacy during the Civil War. Then the Potomac flowed through the center of a military chessboard, so that today a comfortable drive from Washington takes visitors to some of the most important battle sites of the Civil War. Manassas, the first great battle of the Civil War. Antietam, America's bloodiest single day of battle. Fredericksburg, a stunning defensive victory for the Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Gettysburg, the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. Appomattox Courthouse, Lee's final surrender, a nation is reunited. Summer is at its hottest on July 21st, 1861, but there are folk in Washington, D.C. who feel that it's a fine day for a Sunday picnic and an event to make it memorable. Mr. Lincoln from Illinois is in the White House with a rebellion on his hands. Today, he's sending his 90-day volunteers to put it down. So, armed with parasols and picnic baskets, the fine folk from Washington journey almost 30 miles into neighboring Virginia near a railroad junction called Manassas to watch those troublesome rebs get the britches whipped off them. An exceptional day for a picnic. General Irvin McDowell is in command of the operation. He's under pressure to get this over with while his 90-day volunteers are still around for roll call. He has a roster of eager officers, Sherman, Custer, Ricketts, Burnside. This stream is called Bull Run. After a feigned attack at the Stone Bridge, McDowell is marching his volunteers three miles upstream crossing at Sudley Ford. His plan is a good one. He will swing north of the rebels and engage their left flank. But his 90-day volunteers aren't trained for anything like this 14-mile march in the blazing sun. There are rumors that some of them stop to chat with the Sunday churchgoers at Sudley Ford, and that on the march, they are breaking rank to pick wild blackberries. Well. It is a fine day for a picnic. McDowell plans a surprise attack, but his volunteers are too slow. The outnumbered Confederates see it coming and shift their defenses to Matthew Hill, where the first major battle of the Civil War begins. are pushed back. On Henry Hill, they tried desperately to make a stand. When General B of South Carolina catches a glimpse of an officer standing fast with his Virginia brigade, there stands Jackson like a stone wall, he shouts to his men. Rally behind the Virginians. Thomas Jonathan Jackson, like a stone wall. B's troops rally with Jackson's and the last of Joseph Johnston's troops who had arrived by rail. Together, they counterattack. On the hill, McDowell's Union artillerymen see troops approaching, but since uniforms are not as yet standardized in either army, these attacking rebels are wearing blue. The Federals hold their fire too long. McDowell gives a command for disciplined retreat. But with untrained volunteers and inexperienced officers, retreat becomes a rout. Panicking, the picnickers clog the roads back to Washington, which are a welter of fleeing soldiers. McDowell's retreat becomes the great skedaddle. Forty-eight 
hundred casualties. The governments on each side of the Potomac awaken to the possibility of a long, grim, full-time war. The divided states were even divided on how they named a battle site. Confederates called this battle Manassas, after the railroad junction, while the Federals named it after a stream that flowed between the two armies, Bull Run. It took General McDowell three days to arrive here from Washington, D.C. with his green troops. Today, it takes a visitor about 30 minutes. Tall in the saddle, General Jackson surveys the battlefield where he earned the name Stonewall. Were he alive today, Jackson might find the heroic proportions of his monument, well, embarrassing. He wasn't very tall, somewhat unkempt, a picky eater. His field library consisted of three books, the Bible, a dictionary, and Napoleon's Maxims of War. Jackson's horse, Little Sorrow, was a scruffy animal that bore his master through all of his campaigns without a wound. Behind Jackson, the strong defensive line at the crest of the hill protected the southern cannons that hit the oncoming Federals. These cannon, running out from the National Park's visitor center, now stand silent. They trace the Union lines at the battle's peak. This White House stands next to the gravesite of Judith Henry, an 84-year-old widow who was killed by a cannon shell that hit her house. She was the battle's only civilian casualty. A civilian by the name of Wilmer McLean was so appalled by the battle that he fled Manassas and resettled in the peaceful surrounds near Appomattox Courthouse. And with good judgment at the time, just over a year later, in August of 1862, another battle rages on this ground. In his effort to seize Richmond, President Lincoln commands Pope to take his Union army deeper into Virginia. Attack, not defense, Pope blusters. His fellow officers call him a bag of wind. Folklore has it Pope boasted, my headquarters are in the saddle. Everyone snickers. Pope doesn't know his headquarters from his hindquarters. Pope blusters into Virginia. At Manassas Junction, Stonewall captures Pope's horde of supplies and puts them to the torch after his hungry men get a taste of such delicacies as pickled oysters and canned lobster. Stonewall deploys his men near Sudley Church, where an unfinished railroad cut provides an ideal defensive position. Boastfully, Pope means to bag the whole crowd. Federal troops advance in a two-mile line across the field. The Union is gaining. By the end of the second day's fighting, some Confederates run out of ammunition. They throw rocks. But the tide shifts when Confederate General James Longstreet, his men call him Old Pete, deploys his divisions. Pope finds himself between two fires, Old Pete on his left, Stonewall on his right. Longstreet's men rush to attack, past Dogan House, which still stands today on its original site. More Confederates push past Shin House, where only a foundation remains. Pope's Federals are chased back across Bull Run, back to Washington, D.C. Sudley Church, still a house of worship for a Southern congregation. After the Civil War, it was rebuilt with the help of Northern donations an act of brotherly concern. The walls of this old house, stone house, held up in the path of cannon fire. Through both of the year apart battles, it served as a field hospital for the dead, dying, and wounded. There are few monuments in this battlefield of 490 men of the 5th New York Zouaves 
123 died here, the greatest loss of life suffered by a federal infantry regiment in any Civil War battle. The South exulted in a second victory of Manassas. And Union General Pope, he had blustered, success and glory are in the advance. Disaster and shame lurk in the rear. Three days after second Manassas, Pope was relieved of command. Lincoln turns to George McClellan to reorganize the Union Army and bring it out of chaos. McClellan is a prudent and well-organized general who puts caution above all other considerations. Lee's troops are in wretched condition, half famished, thousands without shoes, but their morale is high. Lee needs a victory on northern soil. Gambling against time, he divides his forces, sending Stonewall to take the strategic garrison at Harper's Ferry, now a national historical park at the junction of the Potomac and Shenandoah Rivers. Lee crosses the Potomac and invades Maryland. Marching to halt Lee, McClellan's army is stronger in men and equipment. Its weakness is McClellan. On September 13th, Lee's Special Order Number 191, containing his objectives, routes, and timetables, falls into McClellan's hands. I have the plans of the rebels, he wires Lincoln. It is the intelligence coup of the war, but McClellan is incapable of the rapid responses to make full use of it. September 17th, 1862. The armies collide in western Maryland along Antietam Creek, a mile from the town of Sharpsburg. Even though Stonewall rejoins him, Lee finds himself fighting sooner than he intended and with fewer men. Fighting erupts like flash fires on three distinct sites. The cornfield, Bloody Lane, and the Burnside Bridge. The day's first battle begins in a head-high cornfield in the early hours of the morning. Again and again, the field is lost and recovered. South of the cornfield, riflemen take cover in a sunken wagon road, a natural trench, soon to become Bloody Lane. Three times the Federals attack in waves, unable to see the crouching riflemen until it's too late. They fall as grain before a reaper until they succeed in flanking the sun. Now men are firing into each other's faces. Confederates' cover becomes their open grave and the center of Lee's line is broken. But the Union troops are too spent to press the advantage gained at Bloody Lane. It is Union General Burnside's mission to advance his troops across Antietam Creek. Objective, to open up yet another front that Lee will be forced to defend, but Burnside is too slow. 
At the Burnside Bridge, the third battle rages for three hours. 500 Georgia and South Carolina sharpshooters keep Burnside's 13,000 troops from crossing to the other side. One company tries to wade the creek. By 1 p.m., Pennsylvania and New York troops succeed in taking the bridge. But the federal advance is stymied by the arrival of reinforcements from Harper's Ferry. Militarily, Antietam is a stalemate. Clara Barton, pioneer of American nursing, is tending the wounded. Total casualties for the 14 hours of daylight, more than 23,000 killed, wounded, or missing. It is America's bloodiest day. The names of more than 1,800 men buried at the small cemetery at the edge of Antietam battlefield are unknown. Presiding over the shaded lawn is a monument to the true hero of Antietam, the private soldier. The locals call him Old Simon. On the Antietam National Battle Site today, one can drive or stroll over ground that soaked up more American blood in one day than any other in these reunited states. A picket line of monuments stands where the Yankees and the Confederates fell like sheaves to the scythe. By noon, the cornfield had changed hands 13 times, a deadly seesaw. In describing the fighting here, General Hooker wrote that every stalk of corn in this field was cut as closely as could have been cut with a knife, and the slain lay in rows. In a gloomy aftermath of the battle, wounded soldiers wandered for days in the woods. Among those wounded was a future Supreme Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Of five attacking Union divisions that tried to cross the cornfield, only one reached the church. Ironically, the church belonged to the Dunkers, a pacifist sect. Once a year, members relive the Sunday when distant gunfire from the battle at South Mountain could be heard during the morning service. This road had been sunken by a traffic of farm wagons en route to a grist mill, forming the trench from which Southern riflemen shredded waves of Yankee troops. A witness reported of the fallen Northerners, the ground was covered in blue. I could have walked without putting my foot on the ground. And after the tide had turned, this trench became the Confederate rifleman's pit grave. It was said, in this road there lay so many dead rebels that they formed a line which one might have walked upon as far as one could see. Today this sunken road is memorialized as Bloody Lane. Standing here at Antietam Creek, one can see how only 500 sharpshooters kept the piecemeal attack of the almost 13,000 federal troops from crossing this stone bridge. For one Union regiment, it took a promise of whiskey before they joined in taking the bridge. It is called Burnside Bridge now, after the general who commanded the troops that failed to cross in time. Had they done so, Antietam might have been a decisive Northern victory. President Lincoln, however, considers Antietam a moral victory for the North. And seizing a political opportunity, uses the occasion to announce his Emancipation Proclamation. The war over states' rights becomes a crusade against slavery. President Lincoln, a consummate politician, was also a man of heart and felt deeply for the common soldier, North and South. One could hear this war's heartbeat in a flurry of songs, more songs turned out than for any other American war. Songs heating the blood and cooling the homesickness. 
songs easing the tedium of training camp routine. The Civil War soldier, whether a Billy Yank or a Johnny Reb, is usually a country boy with little mind for military discipline. His infantry weapon is an Enfield or Springfield muzzle loader with a rifled bore, usually of 58 caliber. Effective range, 250 yards. Early on, he wears an all-wool uniform that might have been hand-sewn by patriotic ladies back home. Meals are a chore. Since the army doesn't enlist cooks, the soldier's on his own. He prepares rations of salt pork, beans, potatoes, and flour as best he can. Rations are coffee and hardtack, or cornbread. Most of the time, he sleeps in a tent combs his hair with a tortoise shell comb, and mends his socks from a kit he calls a housewife. Like soldiers in every war, he enjoys pinups, daguerreotypes from Paris, France, or cutouts from ladies' fashion catalogs. He is known to gamble, poker or dice. If he enjoys reading, he'll devour the camp newspaper or a penny novel. But at a rumor of marching orders, for some, it's the Bible that he reads. In November of 1862, marching orders came by command of General Lee. Lee is fighting a defensive war on home ground which is what his outnumbered army of Northern Virginia does superbly. One of his men, faceless among those thousands with marching orders, is a 19-year-old who has earned his sergeant's stripes. His name is Richard, Richard Kirkland from South Carolina. It's a name that bears remembering. The Federals have their marching orders too by command of newly promoted General Ambrose Burnside. His is another name we remember. It is Burnside's haircut that gave sideburns their name. He is a general who is filled with self-doubt. Has he the ability to command so large a military force? Had he been too slow in crossing the creek at Antietam? No one is more amazed at Burnside's promotion than Burnside himself. At Fredericksburg, Virginia, located in the middle of a hundred mile corridor between the Capitol at Washington and the Confederate capital of Richmond, the armies meet to do battle. Union generals make battle plans at Chatham. General Lee's main force is dug in on high ground, just a mile west of the town. General Longstreet's artillery commands the field from the summit of Marie's Heights. At the foot of the hill, 2,000 crack riflemen from Georgia and South Carolina crouch behind a stone wall, waiting. Stonewall Jackson's Corps holds a long wooded ridge, protecting the Confederate right flank. Again, Burnside acts too slowly, this time in crossing the Rappahannock. 
When he does get his federal troops across, Lee is ready. Four entire divisions of Union soldiers are slaughtered before the stone wall. Fredericksburg, Virginia is an easy drive from Washington, D.C. It's a pleasant place to visit. At first glance, one doesn't suspect that during the Civil War, this old colonial town withstood bombardments by both armies and looting. The fierce battles of Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, the Wilderness, and Spotsylvania, all of them were fought within a 17-mile radius of this city. These battlefields are preserved in the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Battlefield. Presidents Washington and Lincoln were entertained here. Chatham, an elegant colonial mansion. It was already 90 years old when Union generals commandeered it as a command post. At Phillips House, one mile away, Burnside planned the battle that for him failed disastrously. In the battle's aftermath, Chatham saw service as a hospital. Chatham stands on the banks of the Rappahannock. George Washington grew up nearby. They say that he threw silver dollars across this river just to test his arm. A very able Union general, George Meade, attacks here. At first he gains ground, but Stonewall Jackson's reserves and Confederate artillery are too much for him. Searching these woods, one can find rifle pits dug by Jackson's men still grooved in the earth. Rows of family homes have been built to the verges of the restored stone wall where those Confederate riflemen opened up to the bloody slaughter of the Federal troops. After the battle, throngs of Union wounded writhed at the base of the wall, groaning, bleeding, thirsting. The next day, a 19-year-old Confederate sergeant risked his life again and again in climbing over the wall, bringing water to his wounded enemies, who, like him, had simply obeyed their marching orders. His name? Richard Kirkland of South Carolina. To those who died here, he is the angel of Marie's Heights. Burnside is replaced by fighting Joe Hooker. In May of 1863, Hooker encircles Lee with federal forces and plans to strike from the rear. The two armies confront each other 10 miles west of Fredericksburg at a country crossroads called Chancellorsville. Boldly, General Lee divides his army, sending Jackson's 30,000 men on this narrow country lane across the entire Union front. Two and one half hours before dusk, the 2nd of May, 1863, Jackson's men spring from the woods in a surprise attack on the Federal right wing. Hooker's men, taken off guard, fall back in frantic retreat. has a smashing victory. Today at Hazel Grove, the cannon that fired toward the Chancellorsville clearing are mute. Stones. The remains of the foundation of Chancellorsville, the roadside inn where fighting Joe Hooker was stunned by a cannon shell that shattered the pillar he was standing near. These woods haven't changed much since that night that Stonewall Jackson was spurring his horse back to his own lines after inspecting the front. It was almost dark. Some of his own men mistook him for enemy cavalry. 
Jackson fell. When the mistake was discovered, he was jostled in a horse-drawn ambulance for 27 miles to this building, a plantation office. He fought his last battle here, against the mortal wounds and against pneumonia. He lost. And the South's commander, General Lee, had lost that gallant soldier he called his own right arm. Without him, at a time when he plans to repeat his 1862 invasion of the North. Lee's reasons are sound. Chancellorsville was a smashing victory. A successful invasion now will encourage the peace party of the North to press for peace terms and might earn for the Confederate States diplomatic recognition by Queen Victoria and Louis Napoleon. His plan is to capture Harrisburg, the Pennsylvania capital, and from there, strike to Philadelphia or to Baltimore. Foreseeing the threat, the governor of Pennsylvania clamors for 50,000 volunteers for the state militia. Heading a hungry army, Lee invades. General George Gordon Meade, newly appointed commander of the Union Army of the Potomac, moves in for the defense. The Confederates succeed in cutting the telegraph lines between Washington, D.C. and its army. For General Meade, rumors supplant army intelligence. But Lee himself is blindfolded by lack of information on the concentration of northern forces. His peerless cavalry leader, Jeb Stuart, has gone off on a fruitless ride for glory around the entire Union Army. On a torrid July 1st, 1863, as if by accident, Union and Confederate forces collide in the area of a crossroads town where neither Lee nor Meade planned to fight. Gettysburg. Gettysburg, the largest and most frequently visited of the Civil War battlefields. Four months after the battle, President Lincoln, at the dedication of the Soldiers' National Cemetery, said, We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. Now it is occupied by a standing army in metal and stone. The Virginia Memorial with Robert E. Lee astride his horse traveler. A monument memorializing the name of every Pennsylvanian defending the soil of his home state. A monument to the boys in gray from North Carolina and Mississippi. This is John Burns, a 72-year-old Gettysburg cobbler who was not about to stand by while his hometown was being invaded. He shouldered his musket and fought beside the boys in blue, 
He was wounded three times and lived nine more years to tell about it. This monument was dedicated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1938. It is a monument to peace, the only one on a Civil War battlefield. And still another president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, took pleasure in retracing the battle maneuvers with his Gettysburg guest, Field Marshal Montgomery, British hero of World War II. It is all here. The opening shots are fired on the morning of a hot July in an unplanned engagement between an advance party of a Confederate infantry and the pickets of a Union cavalry division. Troops coming up from the rear converge on Gettysburg from every direction. Union forces arrive from the south and Confederate forces arrive from the north. Now Confederate General Early attacks General Howard's flank throwing the Union 11th Corps into a rout. The Confederates press the Union 1st Corps from Seminary Ridge, and the Corps retreats to Cemetery Hill, aptly named, considering the day's casualties. By nightfall, the Confederates are 10,000 troops stronger than the Federals. But within hours, Meade swells the Union forces by three more divisions. On the second day, Lee is determined to keep on attacking. From north and south, he strikes at both enemy flanks. His attack on Culp's Hill fails. Meanwhile, on the south flank, without permission, Union General Dan Sickles moves his entire corps of Union defenders dangerously forward, positioning a line extending from a peach orchard to a rugged area of huge boulders. Both of his flanks are exposed. None too soon, the Confederates assault. The fighting, raw, fierce, cruel. The wheat field, Devil's Den, the Valley of Plum Run, which ran red with blood, and the slopes of Little Round Top. By nightfall of the second day, the Federals are holding intact on Cemetery Ridge, but the Confederates hold the ground in front, Devil's Den, the wheat field, the orchard. The third, destined to be the final day's battle, begins to use Lee's words in the early gray of the morning. Invaders and the defenders clash. For seven hours in the blistering summer sun, they fight brutally at Culp's Hill, at Spangler's Spring. At 11 a.m., the Confederates withdraw, having gained no ground. The fields are bogs of corpses. There is a shadowless noonday lull and the cloying stench of unburied heroes and rotting horse flesh. And then at precisely 1.07 p.m., along the two miles of Confederate lines, over 130 pieces of field artillery open up. The Federals respond with an 80-gun cannonade for two full hours, an artillery duel rages. Fire! Fire! Along this broad front on Cemetery Ridge, the target Yankees, hugging the ground, escape annihilation. Lee's cannoneers, blinded by smoke and dust, 
are aiming too high to wipe out their enemy. Against the advice of his aides, Lee targets the center of the Union line. The attack, he warns, must succeed. Twelve thousand men in gray advance in perfect rank with pride and swagger across these meadows toward the bristling center of the Union line. Twelve thousand men marching lockstep up this hillside, then breaking into double time, and then with an outcry of death-defying yells, charge headlong into a suicide of Union fire. Pickett's charge fails, and the Union holds. Confederate losses, 2,396 dead, 11,882 wounded. Union losses, 3,155 dead, 14,529 wounded. It is the most costly battle ever fought on American soil. In the multitude of corpses, Union surgeons discover the body of a young woman clad in a Confederate uniform. She had followed her husband into battle and into death. This ill-advised charge some may call it foolish if not stupid, has inspired more painters and poets than any other action of the war. They see in these doomed men of Pickett's charge tragic gallantry, a final gasp of knighthood, where devotion to a cause could overcome all opposing forces, no matter how overwhelming, where courage alone prevails. The wilderness, just a few miles from the Fredericksburg battlefield. Here, some 10 months after Gettysburg, Union troops are pitted against Lee's forces in this maze of forest. Every cursing soldier becomes his own general. Some men shoot their own comrades by mistake. Though this battle ends in a draw, the Union Army does not pull back as it always had. Lee is getting his first taste of the new General-in-Chief of the Armies of the United States, General Ulysses S. Grant who swears that he will fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. Grant fights a war of attrition, attack on all fronts. Hammer at them until Confederate forces are exhausted. A Midwestern farm boy who had failed at most everything he tried, his father cautions, be careful, Ulysses, you're a general now. It's a good job. Don't lose it. Yeah. 
Lee turns to fight again, eight miles south at Spotsylvania. Bullets fly so thickly that they topple trees. The two armies grapple with each other savagely, hand to hand, from these trenches. They are known as Bloody Angle now. They mark the beginning of trench warfare. But this time, it is Lee who pulls back. And back. Lee is warned by his own staff. That man will fight us every day and every hour until the end of the war. June 2nd, Battle of Cold Harbor. Winter of 64, 65. Siege of Petersburg, March 30th to April 1st, Battle of Five Forks. By April of 1865, the Confederacy is beaten. Today, the visitors approach the restored village of Appomattox on foot. Cars are forbidden. They approach with respect, for it is here in April of 1865 that effectively this war, a grim condition of everyday life for four agonizing years, simply ends. Silence pervades. the home of Lorenzo Kelly, the village handyman, the tavern where U.S. officials work through the night printing the paroles allowing Lee's 28,000 Confederates to return home. General Grant awakens that Palm Sunday morning with a headache. An aide discovers him pacing outside his quarters, holding his hands to his head. Later, after receiving a final request from General Lee to discuss surrender, Grant confesses that his headache is cured. The ironies of war have come full circle. Near the Appomattox County Courthouse stands the fine brick home of one Wilmer McLean, seeking peace Mr. McLean had fled Manassas after the clash of arms in 1861 and resettled himself and his family in this house in Appomattox, then untouched by the war. He had been heard to say that he hoped that he might never see another soldier. Now the supreme soldier of the South, General Robert E. Lee is waiting in the parlor of McLean's commandeered house. Lee is tired. He might be dozing when he hears General Grant and his aides climbing the front steps. Grant enters. Lee stands, resplendent in his dress uniform and glittering saber. Grant is in field dress. His boots are muddy. They shake hands. Grant mentions that they had met once before during the Mexican War. Lee remembers the occasion. Later, Grant will recall I felt like anything rather than rejoicing at the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly and had suffered so much. Grant's terms are generous indeed. When Lee's Scarecrow Army learns of the surrender, 
There are men who smash their rifles. Officers who break their swords. And they weep. The defeated lay down their arms. There's not a jeer from the victors, not one sigh of triumph. Rather, Union soldiers share their rations with starving Southerners until every haversack is empty. Lee's deputy, General Longstreet, asks, why do men fight who were born to be brothers? Lee, the gentleman soldier of the past. Grant, the hard-nosed soldier of the future, each fought the other with honor, with cunning, and with great respect. But in the four-year rending of a nation, the Union dissolved, the Union preserved. It was this giant who was the bedrock antagonist of Robert E. Lee and his ideals. In the capital of the preserved Union, they face each other still, from the marble stairs of this monument across the Potomac to the front steps of Lee's house. Many visitors to the memorial battlefields return to Washington, their point of departure, some with sore feet. For many, underlying the picnicking and souvenir hunting and picture taking, it has been a pilgrimage and in the afterglow of these visits, after sorting out the sights, one is aware of a sense of healing. Lincoln captured these feelings in one of his last speeches. With malice toward none, with charity toward all. Thank you. 